Going through the early Stones albums can be a little daunting, since there is a lot there to listen to. While I went through my deep dive of the early Stones' Brian Jones years, I used this collection as my guide, the Rolling Stones singles collection, The London Years. This is a very special set since it collects all the Stones singles from 1963 to 1971 from their Decca years, their first label, which was later taken over by Alan Klein and his label Abco. Too much drama around that. Can't get into that right now. Originally released in 1989, this was a very special set because this was the first time that all of the Stones' early singles were put into one collection like this. I really love this collection, and this was really my um, compass as I was going through the Brian Jones' early Stones years. And because the set is so comprehensive, all the big songs are here, or the A-sides of the singles, if you will, but it also has some lesser-known songs in the B-sides. And so with that, you do have a very complete view of what the Stones were doing during this period. And that can be extremely helpful, especially if you do find that the proper albums during this period are a little tough to wade through. And by the way, this set doesn't exist just on CD. This set can be found on all of your favorite streaming platforms. I found out that Scott Galupo from YouTube's Keith Richards Riff Cousins was also a fan of this collection. So I decided I'd speak to him about this fantastic set. So, Scott, you know, The London Years was released. I did my research. August 15th, 1989, which, according to my calculations, was about a week and a half or so before Steel Wheels. Do you remember these two releases, the London Years and Steel Wheels, uh, coming you know, at the heels of each other? Did that, in at, at any way, cause a clash of sounds or a clash of identities for the band and what you were listening to as a fan? It didn't for me. I mean, maybe they felt that way because they were, you know, how Mick is anti-nostalgic and mm -hmm. they were just coming up out of this little mini breakup that wasn't a, wasn't officially a breakup, but maybe they thought it was ill-timed. But for me, that was a big year. That was my first year where I was able to buy something on my own. Uh, so I was 13 years old, uh, just turned 13 that summer. So, and it was like, I had already had Hot Rocks on cassette. When the singles collection, when I saw that, it was like Hot Rocks Plus. Right. Some of the songs that, the singles that were not on Hot Rocks, and I hadn't bought all the the albums yet. So a lot of that material, not a lot of it, but some of it was was brand new to me. Mm -hmm. And it was eye-opening or ear-opening because they were so wildly inventive back then uh, in a way that we don't, we forget now. Yeah. How inventive and innovative they were with instrumentation, arrangement, and melodies. Uh, so I, I, I have I, to this day I have a fondness for that collection. Like even on Spotify, I will go find that compilation more often than I will any of the others. Hey, you're right. It really is a snapshot of their powers and especially early on this was their beginnings you're seeing the evolution of the band here in the genesis really but already there is a growth happening and um disc two is when things really kind of coagulate in a great way but disc one is very fascinating it is and you could tell they were green i mean that very first signal saying come on it sounds kind of it's kind of weak you know it doesn't uh and i hadn't heard the original chuck berry so, that was not that was it's not a very well known Chuck Berry song as far as he's concerned either really. not not yeah. really right. so I didn't know that song at all and I'm kind of, it's like that one sounded kind of old fashioned to me uh, but we have to remember how fast everything was happening back then I mean that was 1963 and then by 1965 66 everything had changed and in those, I mean, they, I guess that like compared to the Beatles, they were considered like laggards. But in by the 80s and 90s, when bands were taking five years to put out a new album, consider how fast, how ferocious that pace was. Right. What was it, a single every eight weeks or so back then? Something like that, yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, and um, you, you're seeing that happen, especially in disc one. You know, it starts with Come On, and it ends with um, As Tears Go By. And 
you know, there are some tracks on there that are, like you say, green. I mean, there are some that are really ramshackle productions, like, you know, on um, Tell Me, for example. Like, it's a charming track, but boy, there are things that could have been tightened up. And you're just like, well, that's how fast they were moving. And what could they do? Yeah, I mean, I think that the 12, Eats 12 string and his vocal were like heard the same mic. Oh, I don't want to say that. Uh, and that was, that's like the difference between having George Martin and Andrew Oldham. Uh huh. You know, right. Andrew Oldham, I don't, they wouldn't have become as big as they did without him. I should take nothing from him. He had great ears, a great sense of marketing and provocation and all that. But as an actual knob twiddler, I, I don't know how great he was or, or, or how useful he was to them. He must have known that at some point. Well, that I think is probably one of the um, dead ends I always had with this era for the longest time was that I was always dissatisfied with um, the fidelity, the audio quality and the production because it was so inconsistent. You know, um, from one track, it sounded great and strong and punchy. And then you listen to something like I Want to Be Your Man, which is one of my favorite tracks from that era. And it's just like, how do they record this with a potato? Like, how yeah. is this possible? It, it is and I guess, you know, they were on the fly. They were in Chess Records or Chess yeah. Studios for a little. They were in RCA in LA. Uh, so they were just kind of flying by the seat of their pants, mm -hmm. you know, before they got cozy at Olympic Studios and right. they could spread out and, <laughs> and take their time and got a real producer. Um, but yeah, it is kind of, the results are inconsistent. Mm -hmm. uh, and the playing... The playing is very sharp, though. I like. Um, I think it's simple, but but sharp. What do you make of what do you make of the playing, specifically Charlie? Because I know you've said that for you personally, Charlie really comes to his own, you know, around some girls on, you know, yeah, in yeah. many in many ways. So, what are your thoughts to hear him a little bit rough around the edges in these early takes? To me, it's like he's like a different guy. Yeah. I mean, I can hear Keith. Even before the open tunings, you can hear that it's him. Because right. he, he doesn't solo much differently now. <laughs> than that. Like, the solo that um, it's all over now that John Lennon famously ragged on him about. He's not much better than that. He never did get all that. He did get a little bit better. Like During Steel Wheels, during that sympathy solo. Remember that epic solo? Yes. And part of that is just you know, better gear and more distortion and sustain. Right. Where you can, you know, the, a little gesture can sound much bigger than it did back then where you had to push everything. It had to be pushed so hard. Uh, and, and the only gain you had was turning your amp up and getting it past the edge of breakup. Right. That was your, that was it. That's all you had. And even the, the satisfaction fuzz pedal, it sounds great for that track but I think that you never heard from it again because it right. it's, it's not a very pleasant sound <laughs> it worked for that track worked beautifully it was historic and take nothing away from it but God, I don't want to hear that thing ever again <laughs> and, you know, and Keith has uh, said the same that it's ironic that for a guy who likes to keep things pretty organic he was one of the first to introduce you know electronics and add-ons and pedals like the fuzz on Tennis Faction and I get that was kind of accidental. I mean, it wasn't it Ian Stewart who said, try this? You know, went, Oh, was it? I think he went and bought it and said, try this thing. At least that's one of the stories I've heard about how he came into that pedal. The Maestro, it was a Gibson pedal, I think, whatever it was. But I, I don't like fuzz guitar. I mean, that, that's yeah. just a personal uh, preference of mine. I, I don't like it by anybody, really. Uh, even... Jimi Hendrix. I mean, I don't, I don't love fuzz tone. Yeah. Well, anyway, it can be very scratchy. Yeah, by design, and you know, a little bit goes a long way. Right. Um. But on, but back to like Charlie, to me, sounds like a different guy in, in, on those early records. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, you listen to a track like "I'm Free," and he kind of is a little bit rough on some of those changes. You can tell that maybe one more rehearsal could have helped, you know, yeah. but again, it's a charming track, but still like, um, 
it's a little bit of a head scratcher because in a way for me, this whole era is another band altogether for me, oh, not yeah. just Charlie. Now, if you put that on a grid, like now where they can quantize beats that are out of place, <laughs> it would probably look, it would be a disaster. <laughs> it would be a disaster. And and Charlie was a great timekeeper. I mean, uh, yeah. But yeah, also a human being. And those stop starts thing were, were kind of, who knows who was throwing it. It could be guitar. Guitar players, we are famous for speeding things up and throwing off a drummer. So, you know, it, it might not be his fault. Right. Why those, you know, those things didn't fall on the grid. In um, in, in a grand scale, though, the London years, it really was, Are you? Um, I think you were mentioning that for yourself and maybe for a lot of fans during that time, it was like a sort of an, an education on the Stones for the first time, right? Because this was the first time you were seeing this entire history in one spot and you could finally trace things through. So I think it, it was probably a big deal for it to have come when it did. Yeah, I mean, not only did... So this was kind of like, why didn't they... Why did Alec Klein do this? Why didn't they do it? Uh, I guess they didn't have the rights to it. That, that's a big reason. But they were always a few years behind trend. when mm -hmm. it Like, unplugged... By the time they wanted to do Shrift, <laughs> 1995, Unplugged had already peaked in popularity. So, it's, and then they don't even call it Unplugged. It's like it's Unplugged, <laughs> right. but not really. Right. And Unplugged isn't even really a thing anymore, and it's not that big of a deal. Right. So I'm glad that Alan Klein's company released a box set because they probably never would have done it. It took them how long to do? 40 licks to get the two eras together. So that was, another, that was over 10 years later. And and they added, they left songs off that should have been on there and they added four superfluous new tracks. So in this instance, I'm kind of like, you know what? I'm glad that Alan Clark's people did that because maybe they ended up doing a better job than the Stones would have. Well, I tell you, I hope in the next tour they finally bring out Keys to Your Love. That's that's. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. I've got the keys to your love. Yeah. It's classic, Scott. Well, I tell you, one of the things I enjoyed going through this set was that um, it's such a cliche, but I got to say that, and I'm going to devote a video to this, but to see the growth is one thing, but to all of, a sudden, all of a sudden see it come together with something impactful, like satisfaction, where it's like almost like manna from heaven, it seemed like this beautiful thing came that just nailed everything that embodied everything and i still listen to that track and i'm impressed the hell out of that track i think everyone is firing off on all cylinders and i think that's one of the best like victories in the set is by the time you get to that track it's quite a moment it, it is and it's and i feel this the, the last time is the other one. Oh yeah and they're very similar in the core progressions I, it's like uh no oh, eda kind of thing yeah yeah, I mean, um, which it's amazing to get that kind of mileage out of <laughs> three chords. But and it's interesting that uh, Steve Van Zant of uh, the uh, of the E Street Band and his own, you know, famous guy in his own right, he loves this period of the Stones. Like mm. he doesn't love the the big the golden age and everything after it. He likes this uh, this era. But he interviewed Keith about E, D, and A, and he thinks that Keith was the first guy to do that. Like he couldn't, and Keith is like, I don't remember where I got that chord progression. It may have been from the new Lost City Ramblers or something like that. Um, but from a musical standpoint, you know, D is not in the key of E. Uh, if that makes any sense, it's... Mm -hmm. it, it's out. It's only something a guitar player would come up with, I think, because you learn those. It's one of the the first five chords you learn: the shapes C, A, G, E, and D. And if you don't know any music theory, you might try to jam those chords together because that's all you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know if that's actually true. If he's the first guy to, to come up with E, D, and A. Uh, well, I want to. I want to. I want to ask. Well, I mean, were there any big songs that were DCG songs? 
<laughs> you know, I mean, EDA yeah. is one thing. I mean, but what about another key? It's the same movement, you know? Yes. Yeah. Because C is not in the key of D. Uh, but if you all you know are those basic cowboy chords, you would you would do that. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, it became ubiquitous. Oh, yeah. I, I don't actually think that he's the first guy to do that. Like he can't, he can't be. That no, that seems like again. I mean, it seems like it was just floating in the air. Yeah, like Bob Dylan must have done that at some point, uh, right? Yeah, yeah, I would think so. Right. Um, Started sixty two. Uh huh. Um, what do you make of? Well, first of all, what are some of your favorite tracks off the thing? I mean, maybe there are some big ones, but there are some um, hidden ones that kind of always grabbed your ear. Um, I mean, I love, I love this, this 67 sort of psychedelic pop run of singles that they had. We love you, Danny Lyons. Um, have you seen your mother baby standing in the shadow? Okay. Pause, pause right there. What? I, I, I'm sorry. You're going to, that's going to take me another 10 years or 20 years for me to get my head around that song. That song always throws me for a loop. Have you seen you? Have you seen your mother baby standing in the shadows? What is that song? It, it's why they, they, there's nothing like it before or after in their catalog. They, they did, there's nothing like it. Uh, I don't really know what it means, what the phrase, <laughs> I mean, it's, it, as far as, his lyrics go in that period um sort of social observation and uh anti-establishment uh middle fingers that are very thinly veiled like we love you is um he was really on a hot streak and it's kind of you know, you remember john lennon saying I think in that famously bitter interview with Jan Wenner that uh, he thought We Love You was just a ripoff of, of All You Need Is Love. Oh, okay. Well, that sounds familiar. And that astonishes me because John and Paul are on that track. <laughs> right. And he had to have known or had a discussion with Nick, you would think, about this is not a We Love, a Lovey Dovey song. Right. That's not the point of this song at all. There are jail doors being, you know, the sound of a door clanging. You know, they had just gotten out of jail and and, and they knew that they got out, they, they beat the rap. They knew the people who put them in jail have no power over them anymore. Uh, and and it's like, this song is, it's almost like from a, you know, the the verse where Jesus says, forgive them for they know not what they do. Right. That's like Mick saying, we love you and we hope that our people, we hope you love them too. Mm -hmm. Forgive, we have the power now. Right. Um, so there, there's no all you need as love <laughs> vibe here at all. So I, I, I don't, I would love to talk to a, a Beatles historian about why John thought that about that song. And it doesn't sound like all you need is love at all there's right. no sonic resemblance there's no thematic resemblance except for the word love and and, and and typical with the stones music like i could never mistake that song like you say for all you need is love because there is no sense of um i don't know how warmth or actual love in the song musically even music there's no vibe that's even there's this weirdness underneath it just like a lot of stone songs there's always this weird darkness underneath it and it's not surprising to me that it didn't become a hit because it was too radical. Mm -hmm. It was too radical for the time. Uh, it was, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm surprised, but not so not surprised. I think a lot of people um, kind of dismiss the Stones in this way, where they kind of uh, assume that nothing is going on under the surface, and they take them at face value. So for people to dismiss something like the layers going on on "We Love You." Uh, I'm not surprised and to hear John Lennon I'm not sure what happened there but for him to get his wires crossed um, I don't it seems not surprising either that he would kind of just dismiss them completely as writers he was high on his own supply <laughs> as as one would be if you were John Lennon I mean <laughs> right um, and let's be fair all you need is love if you want to take it beyond face value it is a kind of explosive claim 
of hedonism that you don't need anything else, re- meaning you don't need any religious principles to ground. It, all you need uh, is a utilitarian sort of love for one another, and then the world would work better. That is also an explosive claim that could be missed by listeners, mm-hmm. by the happy and warmth that, that you're talking about. Uh, but there's none of that in, in We Love You, uh, other than the phrase, We Love You, which I guess the lyrics in that song are so cryptic, how he he, yeah. he changes the pronouns. and uh, But, you know, your uniforms don't fit we. <laughs> right. Like, pronoun thing is very is unmix, unmistakable you know the old ways are gone your right. uniforms <laughs> but mick, mick is mick is an interesting writer like that isn't he where he'll he'll take he'll he'll take in a song musically and, and he'll go well i get a sense of where you might be going keith with the song emotionally but uh i'm going to put a different slant on it and you know this is something i would group in that category or something like also street fighting man or simply for devil or even um, brown sugar, because musically brown sugar comes off like a you know I want to rock and roll all night kind of a mm-hmm. vibe, you know. But you've got this very literary, you know, kind of narrative on top, and that's classic Mick to me. He could be very bold and literary when he wanted to be, uh, but he didn't often want to be. I think he mm. um, had a sense of, of that I, he doesn't want to never wanted to overdo it because yeah. it's only rock and roll. And I think, we, right. remember when you were talking to um, Anthony DeCurtis mm. here on, on, on your channel, you had a great interview with him. Thank you. And he mentioned that Amit Erdogan in his memoir, that Mick rejected the idea of publishing his lyrics. Yeah. Uh, as a book, because he didn't think that they were good enough or literary enough. Mm-hmm. Which they, some of them are, but maybe not enough of them are. Right. And uh, I, I kind of like that about Mick, that he doesn't take himself too seriously in, mm-hmm. in that sense. Uh, because you can't, when you take these words out of the music, they do lose some of their mm-hmm. strength. That, uh, I mean, like, take a lot, like, I, I bet your mama was a tent show queen yeah. and all the boyfriends were sweet 16. That's not a particularly literary line, but in context, yeah. it's it's perfect. Oh, yeah. It's a it's classic. It's not an obvious rhyme at all. It's not an obvious line. No, and it, it, it's, it's the same kind of idea of why people have issues with Bob Dylan being a poet. Like, can you strip the music away and can the words hang and sometimes they can but you know yes. both mick and dylan knew that these are songs and it's about being musical big difference absolutely and i my sense when he won when dylan won the nobel they were all together for the desert trip oh yeah. shows, right and they they were kind of razzing dylan about that oh here comes the nobel <laughs> why is winning Bob dylan oh man to be a fly in the wall yeah. Uh, who comes through most on these uh, recordings on the singles collection for you? Is there one particular member that shines through? Not really. I mean, I, they really were a collective in that sense. Uh, uh, it was before, like, he really came into his own as a player. It was before Charlie came into his own. Uh, so they really, it did, it feels like they were a collective. Like, I, the thing that Keith calls the ancient art of weaving and which we associate with Ronnie and supposedly Mick Taylor was not so good at, which I, I don't agree with. But to me, I think Keith and Brian, what he, he meant by that is what was uh, how they would write parts that were composed. They weren't just spontaneously throwing fills at one another. I, I think it would track like off the hook. Uh, the very beginning of that, the two of them weave their parts together. Um, and Spider and the Fly is another one. Is that on this? Well, is, it, it is. is that in this box set? Yep. Yep. Yeah, that's one. another one. It's all over now. Yeah. It's another one where the two of their guitars 
weave together, but and the parts are composed. So in the sense, it is not like Keith and Ronnie just jamming and throwing each other. Very loose. No, they are together. And um, Sitting on a Fence, which is not on the box set, is another great example of the two of them weaving two parts together in a way that, that's just beautiful. I love It's All Over Now. And I was very surprised when I saw the, um, well, I was reminded of it when I watched the Tammy performance. And to realize that it was Brian who really does the very heavy power chords, um, especially during that outro, bum, going from five four one, um, yeah. and I because you know that's to me such a Keith move that very Don Everly strong rhythm part, you know, which I don't know if y'all would attribute to him, but um, a little bit he was a, quite a strong rhythm player himself. Uh, the Everly, you know, Don Everly, wasn't he it? probably he probably influenced both of them to be honest. I mean, he was a big a big influence on everybody Mm -hmm. uh, unsung to this day. Right. There's a a web, a guy on YouTube called the Brian Jones resource. Have you ever heard of him? And he, he does these isolated uh, Brian parts. He plays them on guitar, dulcimer, auto harp. Cool. And you really gain an appreciation for what, uh, what Brian played. He's a very musical guy Mm -hmm. uh, and a very complimentary, and what Keith would call a sympathetic player. Yes. I've heard him say that and label Bill Wyman that way too, which is a very interesting term, isn't it? To to label a musician. Sympathetic, yeah. And I think he must get that from, um, I'm guessing, like the sitar, like in the Indian acoustic music, the strings that you don't fret ring sympathetically. Oh. And, uh, interesting. So... You know, I'm guessing he might have heard something like that and thought, well, I can apply that term to a music a musician himself or herself, where you're not being obtrusive, you're being sympathetic to to the overall sound. Yeah, absolutely. And I yeah, I also saw it as, yeah, knowing how to bob and weave and not just always attack. It's being yeah. humble in a way, also. Um speaking of Brian Jones, do you think um that he's at this point now, properly, quote, rated, for lack of a better word. I mean, there seems to be a faction of fans who are very defensive about him. And do you think now it's finally he's gotten the credit he's, he deserves? That's a hard question because we don't know what he would have done if he had his personal life together and didn't get fired. I I don't know what his ceiling was. You know, I my feeling and I could be completely wrong about this, is that they got everything out of them that there was to get mm. uh, for the trajectory that he was on, mm-hmm. which was a self-destructive. And uh, and I get very, the people, I will call them Brian Partisans, like the guy who wrote a book about Paul Trinka, a British journalist, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, the whole book is, is, it's very unforgiving toward Mick and Keith who are in their 20s and also dealing with all these pressures of fame and Greg getting a lot more glory out of it, I guess. So, but their mistakes are unforgivable and Brian's mistakes we have to overlook. And Mm -hmm. what people, what we learned about Brian as a person is, is unflattering does not do it justice. Well, he was not a good guy, right? mm-hmm. just not a good person. For somebody who had such a problem with fame, and but then Mick said that he would have he would have been better off in trad jazz, like as an academic. So, but he didn't seem like that kind of a guy. He seemed like he liked the life, the, <laughs> the access, right, and the clothes, and uh. So I don't know. It, that's a hard question to answer. He doesn't seem like a guy who would be an, an academic, you know, teaching traditional jazz at, at, a, at a, you know, the Berkeley College of Music or something. It, he doesn't seem like that kind of guy, but uh, we didn't know it. Yeah. I mean, it seems like he had a lot of interest in music, and I think he would eventually 
just given up music and been really good at something else for a little while and then dropped that and been something really good at something else later. He seems to be that kind of person who is a little bit of an ADD kind of situation or something. Yeah. And you I mean, it's, it's hard why he wasn't able to write or, or did they reject what he came up with? Again, that's impossible for us to say uh, because then there, we have Ronnie Wood who really is somebody full of ideas mm -hmm. uh, that they don't, they don't take advantage of. Right. Um, but was Brian that guy? Was Mick Taylor? Mick Taylor, by his own admission, was not a prolific writer. Um, I mean, what do we have? We have one, two solo albums. Mm -hmm. um, that's it. Yeah, and it took him how long to get that first one out after he left the Stones? Didn't, wasn't that like a long time? In 1979. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. I don't know. I, there, there's that thing that he was working on, Brian Jones, I mean, that was it for a film? Mm. He didn't anyway, I've listened to him like, ah, I don't, see, I don't hear any hits that were lurking in there. <laughs> well, yeah, that conversation will, will be ongoing, I think, between fans that, you know, people are always going to be chanting for Brian that he needs more credit. And um, I don't know if we'll ever find a middle ground. Uh, but this this collection really at least puts all his best efforts forward. Um, as, a, as a final question here, what would you say to people who never could get around this part of the band? Because I, for my, I could speak for myself for the longest time, I had a bit of an uphill struggle embracing this era. Because like I said, there's a different band. And I've met many fans who said, oh, I don't really listen to anything pre- beggar's banquet or even between the buttons let's say so listening to come on <laughs> it would be quite a reach what do you say to, to these fans well i would say that i mean this, this is what music sounded like in 1963 and 64 I mean, that's what pop proto rock and roll music sounded like so if you don't like that then okay fair enough you're waiting for a more modern rock sound that of Cream and Hendrix and Zeppelin. I, I get, I understand that. Um, but look for the musicianship, listen for the melodies. Like just, just isolate the melodies and how they were able to came, come up with, like I always, my favorite Beatles albums are John, pre-psychedelic John Lennon. Uh, and I, I'll often give a John Lennon test to songs. Just just sing the melody. Ah. And and you can sing his songs and they're they're perfect. Mm -hmm. They're pure melodic gems. And Mick and Keith were also not quite as gem like as, as Lennon and McCartney. They had other strengths. But things like Ruby Tuesday and Dandelion, She's a Rainbow. Um, mother's little helper. Yeah, let's spend the night together. The these melodies are are phenomenal, and so no, it doesn't have the great searing guitar sound that when amps got bigger and better, the Marshalls, the SVTs, and although they were never really British amp guys, they as soon as they got their hands on Fender amps, they were Fender amp guys, but. You know what I mean? The sound of yeah, uh, of Gimme Shelter and Midnight Rambler. It's just a bigger, more modern sound, and I get that. But my advice would be to just, you know, focus in on the melodies that they created. It's it's not easily done. Um, not not everybody can do it. Not everybody did it. <laughs> right, and they were the one of few people who were doing it, and were like you said doing it at an incredible pace. And um, it, it's really impressive when you put together what they did in the short amount of time they did it. Um, yeah, it's quite a story. Uh, but yeah, so I'm happy that we got to speak about the Singles Collection in the London years. It was great to kind of go down memory lane for me because uh, these were a lot of forgotten gems. And uh, it was fun to talk to you about it, Scott. Uh, Scott, why don't you tell people where to find you online? The name is the name of the channel. Uh, you can search that Scott Galupo and also Keith Richards, Riff Cousins. 
And uh, also, Wadi Wattel guitar solos. There's uh, there's yeah. not many people, for whatever reason, who uh, try to do his solos on YouTube, but uh, he is a treasure trove in his own right. Thank you, Scott. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Justin. Absolutely.